Hello, I'd like to talk to you today about learning scriptural languages and emphasising why it's so important for the study of religious texts um, and in particular what are the benefits and actually the excitement in learning the languages rather than what may seem an obstacle at first sight. Um, I have here on the screen the four key languages that we teach in the faculty Initially, the manuscripts, such as we see here, will look beautiful, but also might look a little intimidating. But you should bear in mind, for many of these languages, the alphabet is no longer than the alphabet for English. So Hebrew on the right here only has 22 letters, four fewer than English. And Greek on the left only has uh, 24 letters. So they're, they're not uh, impossible to learn um, as an alphabet. And once you've start learning them and using them every day, it becomes second nature and you'll see words. But I want to think about what language does and why it's so important to learn the ancient languages to get behind the mentality of the people writing the text and what the texts really mean. You will often hear stories about a particular word having some deep hidden meaning and that sometimes can be true, but is often used more mythically than in reality. Um, stories such as four words for love in Greek um, may be true on one level, but doesn't take us very far. So I want to think about language beyond the word level, although we will return to a word at the end, and think about what language does and how it communicates. Let's begin with a simple sentence. The boy is holding a yellow pen. The beauty of language is that we can read a sentence like this and know immediately what it says, even if we've never heard the sentence before. Indeed, this is the first time I think I've ever said this sentence word for word precisely as it is. And that's how language works, that we know the rules. And once you know the rules, you can construct an infinite number of sentences. It's also a meaningful sentence. It may be that in this picture, the boy is actually not holding a yellow pen, it's a green pen, uh, but actually the sentence still makes sense, even if it's factually incorrect. Something some of you will have explored in philosophy of language and its relationship to God. Another way of saying it is the boy is eating a yellow pen. Now, this is an unlikely sentence, but it shows how grammar works. The grammar still is meaningful. The sentence still has meaning. And the reason why we say it's unlikely is because in the real world, you are unlikely to eat a pen. But grammatically, it still works. Let's take another sentence. The boy is reading a yellow pen. Now, one might reinterpret this and say that they're really reading the text on the pen. But actually, if we take it as a simple sentence, we would say the sentence does not work. The sense makes no sense because reading implies something written. Uh, read a book, you read a letter, you read a text. You don't read a pen. So that the actual level of words, the number of words we would expect to have with the word reading uh, is limited. And therefore, this catches us by surprise. It doesn't work as a sentence. Another type of sentence which doesn't work is an impossible sentence. The boy, a yellow pen, eating. Yellow pen is not a verb. It's a, it's a noun. It's an object. Um, so it can't come in that position in the sentence. In English, we so, show the impossibility of a sentence by the word order. And this makes no sense. That the whole grammar breaks down. But these are examples of how grammar works and how sentences come together and therefore how we can convey different meanings until we get to even what we call the metaphorical meaning going beyond all this and, and saying the pen is mightier than the sword. How a pen now has quite a different meaning. We might say this is an impossible sentence. It's like the boy is reading a yellow pen. But amazingly, we understand this as a metaphor, as an image. Whereas the boy reading a yellow pen, we just read as, no, that's a bad sentence. This is how complex sentences work, but it also shows how beautiful the language is, how languages 
put together images and we know from the rules what works and what doesn't work and we know that because it's our language we, we speak this every day we know it is so when we meet a text an ancient text we don't actually know what the language means we are not native speakers we do not know what the author is trying to think or what his readers would imagine is being conveyed by the language and that's why we need to do research in it and that's why translations we can pick up translations of all the ancient texts indeed for the bible the multiple number of english translation runs into the thousands um, but the translations do not help us when we deal with complexities like this let me give you two little examples of how uh, complex our language is and here we're moving from meaning of words to how words are used in context and the relationship between meanings and contexts are very um, flexible so language and context I'll give you an example you see two people in the corridor and you say your daughter I presume think for a moment what actually the context is. This is a fragment of a conversation, a fragment of a situation, just as our ancient texts are fragments caught in time. What does it mean? If you want, pause this video and write down your thoughts. I'll give some suggestions in a moment. But do bear in mind, in English, we could pronounce this sentence in different ways according to how we stress each word, and that can change the meaning. Have you thought for a moment about it? If so, let us look at some possible suggestions. You may have others of your own. Firstly, in this situation, we presume that you, meeting the two people in the corridor, already know one of the people, because that's why you make an assumption about the other person. Now, it could be you know the daughter is visiting. So when you see someone with a young lady, you say, uh, it's your daughter. But supposing you're recognizing that maybe you need to distinguish between your daughter and someone else's daughter. So you have to put the stress on your, your daughter, I presume, having already seen uh, someone else saying their daughter is visiting. Or you might want to say uh, it's your daughter and not your sister or your mother. So you put the stress on daughter, your daughter. I presume. Note when we put stress on words, this is something we can't see in a written text, which also makes reading an ancient written text all the more difficult. Um, another way could be just a simple guess. Your daughter, I presume, and there you put the stress on I presume. Um, but then there are those are simple factual ways of reading it. Other ways of reading it are those where there is a message under what is being said. So it could be a compliment, you know, that polite way of saying, actually, you both look very young. So when you meet uh, someone who, whose mother is with them and you say your daughter, I presume, um, with a little joking stress on I presume to compliment them that they look so young. Uh, but it could also be an in insult to the first person, say, your daughter, meaning you are rather old because this person can only be your daughter, or it could indeed be a question of morals, your daughter, do you have a daughter, um, or a way of protecting the person who really has a young lover and saying it's a daughter, and therefore with more suggestion in the message. That is how complex language is when you just have here four words which could be read in so many ways. And therefore, as we want to cut out as much interference as possible. And one of those interferences is the fact that we're working in translation. And therefore, we want to get back to an original text and understand it. I'll give you another example before we look at an ancient example, finally. Another example, imagine this situation. Person A says, I have a son, and so B says, that's okay. Person A also says, I have a cat. 
but B says, oh, I'm sorry. What do you think is the context here? Again, if you like, pause and make some notes um, before we come to it. So, here are some suggestions. Perhaps the person has an allergy to cats, and so simply says, OK, sorry if you have a cat. I, I am happy that you have a son. Or perhaps, similarly, they simply don't like cats. But that doesn't make sense of the whole structure of the dialogue. It only makes sense of the one expression. Why have son and then cat? So we need to look further into this and examine a bigger context. Perhaps someone is on a date. You're dating someone and that person says, I have a son, well, I don't, I don't mind a single parent uh, as a partner. But if they say I have a cat, then actually then the allergy or hatred of cats would come in. But perhaps a better explanation is someone is renting a room. I want to rent a room in the house. I have a son, that's okay, we will allow children in the house, but I also have a cat, sorry, I don't allow cats in the house. That would be actually the, a very common and a very likely explanation of this sort of exchange. Um, or we can go for the ludicrous, someone thinks you've given birth to a cat because of the repeated use of have, and then this would be a joke. I have a son, that's okay, I also have a cat, Oh, I'm sorry you've had to give birth to a cat. Ludicrous in the context, a possible reading, but we would say maybe not the most likely reading. So it's an example of how we could read a whole phrase, a whole passage of sentences, and not just the one sentence. If we just read the one sentence, we might say it's a cat allergy. If we read the whole thing, we might say it's someone renting a room. Finally, let me give you one piece of biblical language and show you one of the complexities of studying the biblical texts. Famous passage, Genesis 3, the story of the Garden of Eden and the serpent who tricks Adam and Eve and leads them to eating the fruit of knowledge. In Genesis 3, the serpent is introduced, now the serpent, and now here just indicating the opening of the story, the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal the Lord God had made. This is the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, a very common English translation. If we turn to the Hebrew, here I'll give you a Hebrew word. The Hebrew word is arum, crafty. Here we can see the Hebrew word, I've written it in, uh, um, in, in, in transliteration as arum, um, you can see the Hebrew letters down here in red with the English equivalents. You'll notice there's some similarity between English and Hebrew in the sense that the R letter is really like a reversed R. And the M is square, like an M, if you took the outline of an M. So we're not a million miles away from similar letter forms. But the important thing here is the word arum. Now, it can mean intelligent, or crafty, or clever, and that's ambiguous. Just as in English, the word clever is ambiguous. If you're clever, it means you're intelligent. But clever can also be clever, uh, too clever for his own good. Clever can also be negative. It's intelligence which can be lead to mischief or misdeeds. And that stretching in senses in English is also reflected in Hebrew. We have this stretching of senses. So in Job 5 here, we have the schemes of the crafty. Their hands shall not produce what is genuine. There the word arum refers to crafty in a negative sense. But then in Proverbs, it means something positive. Every smart person, intelligent person, acts with knowledge. So the word has this double meaning in Hebrew. It's interesting to think, is Genesis 3 really to be translated as crafty? As I note here, the intelligent is the translation of the Greek. If you know Greek, the word is phronomos, which means wise, 
in a positive sense. So the Greek translation, which first read the Hebrew in the third century BC, saw this as a positive intelligence. The serpent was intelligent more than any other creature. And perhaps that's how we should think about it, not as uh, a negative. Um, and then we have to read the story in that light. A further and final little point about this example is that um, when we continue reading the story about Adam and Eve, they famously, once they eat of the fruit of the Garden of Eden, they realize they are naked. And indeed, the word for naked is very similar to the word for crafty or intelligent. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Genesis 2, the word for naked is arom. Um, very similar to arum and, and sounds very similar. And probably the author in writing this text was trying to make a connection here that the intelligence of the serpent led to realization by Adam and Eve of their own condition, and that is condition of being naked. And in that way, Adam and Eve actually become as intelligent as the serpent. Uh, and so this wordplay may well suggest that the word arum means intelligent and not crafty. And therefore, we shouldn't follow the NRSV translation in understanding this in a negative way, but perhaps understanding it in a positive way. And that is why the serpent is so successful, because he is so intelligent. So there you have one Hebrew word that I've taught you, if you can remember it, arum, intelligent or crafty, depending on the context. And it's a reminder of how complex context is when reading ancient texts, and therefore we need to read them in the original languages to have a better sense of all the complexity of these wonderful ancient writings. Thank you.